Hello, I'm Kat Sarfis, Forever Bookseller here at Barnes & Noble. Today we are joined by the brilliant Jacqueline Holland. Jacqueline's debut novel, The God of Endings, is one book I cannot stop talking about. It's a gorgeous, era-spanning novel that explores the complexity of the human condition, the nature of immortality, motherhood, vampire mythology, and so much more. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited. So something I really love about your novel is that there are so many uh, things you can sort of take away from it. So as a mom, I was really drawn to sort of, you know, the Leo and Colette storyline. Um, but then as a fan of vampire lore, that mythology sort of consumed me. Um, but then I, I've spoken to those that were captivated with the atmospheric nature and the history of the story and those that really enjoy the profound questions around life and death. So the story seems to take on new meaning depending on the reader. So I have to ask, what was your inspiration to write it? That is the best thing to hear um, <laughs> because I love all those things and those, those elements were very entertaining to me too while I was writing it. I would have to say that the motherhood angle was sort of the, um, the origin point for the story. When I started the book, I was a new mom. I had a three-year-old and a six-month-old. Um, and I was <laughs> not myself a fully formed human being. And I was tired. I was exhausted and I felt so flawed and imperfect. And when you're a mom, we all are familiar with being flawed and, and imperfect. But when you're a mom and you have these people who depend on you and who are so, so obviously vulnerable and so obviously being formed by you, mm -hmm. that that typical run of the mill flawedness really takes on a feeling of monstrosity. It's too much power. It's frightening. And I think like, like most parents, I wanted to do only good to my children. I wanted to give them only good things, but I couldn't. I had to give them myself, which was a really messy mix of good things and bad things and things in process. It was a real kind of existential struggle for me myself this weighing of you know after you've yelled at your kid or you've had a showdown you just feel like the most rotten creature on the earth and you feel like I am failing this I am messing this kid up they would probably be better off with someone else some angelic ideal that doesn't really exist and so when Colette, I call her Colette because that was her name when I first met my protagonist when she appeared to me and started speaking to me, which was very much how it happened. Her voice came and she was talking to me. She took on that sort of crisis and that, that struggle, but she deliciously got to push it to such extremes and make it about actual life and death and actual, you know, monstrosity and destructive power um, mixed with all the love and care and tenderness of any mother. That was where I was coming from at the earliest point with this book. I love that because it definitely, <laughs> that's something that I very much pulled out of it. There was, um, you know, that kind of forced me to, you know, that pause and reflect. Um, but I will tell you that the part where Colette's holding the baby and she's thinking about her fear and the vulnerabilities of that child. And, and you talk about like the power of that defenselessness, what that has on the people who, who care for for it, um, the sort of mixed emotions, like love and horror, and that every parent goes through. And while, you know, in my head, I was like, okay, I know this scene is focusing on the child is obviously speaking to, you know, larger relationships in life. Um, the whole, you know, better to have lived and loved argument, which obviously takes on a very different meaning when you're immortal. <laughs> but I remember thinking to myself, you know, having gone through, and it was funny because I, I have a similar age gap, I would say between, between my two. And I remember that feeling that and you can't even put it into words. And I remember reading that scene and being like, yeah, this, all of this, yeah. like right here. <laughs> like I wanted yeah. to just highlight it and yell that from the rooftops and be like, that's what I'm feeling. That's why I'm crazy. Like this is why all moms are kind of crazy yeah. because it's just this constant back and forth of, you know, again, trying to do your best and then not doing your best and then feeling guilty for it when we're in this kind of spiral of we're never going to be <laughs> that perfect 
idealistic, you know, thought that we have in our mind. And and that feeling that you're describing, it doesn't feel like it at the time when you're experiencing it, but it is a testament to your vigilance for that child that you don't even trust yourself. You know, you care about this this person so much that you're even willing to say, no, I am not good enough. Like I am a danger to, the, you know, there's no one and nothing that is exempt from no. our vigilance. But it does, it takes you a while to realize that. Like you said, in that moment, no, you're like, terrible person. I'm like, <laughs> this is the worst. I'm the worst. Talking about that scene. And then I guess I'm also going to like fast forward, I, you know, the scene uh, later in the novel, I think with Colette and Augustine, like way, you know, way later on, I felt like they took on different meaning. Again, talking about, you know, different things that you pull from the book. I felt like they definitely took on maybe different meaning for me in my position in my life and where, you know, where I am as opposed to maybe someone else who's reading it. But so I have to ask, were there scenes like this throughout your novel that were maybe more difficult to to write or ones that you kind of went in saying, no, this is, I, this is the point. This is where I'm going to make this. The most difficult part to write in the whole book without question was the first chapter that has gone through so many changes. <laughs> uh, and it's because I could have written a whole novel about the first chapter. It focuses on the tuberculosis pl- plague of tuberculosis that went swept New England and the vampire hysteria that resulted, which is all historically factual and just mind blowing and yes. fascinating. <laughs> so I had to, that was just like a little backstory <laughs> to this first chapter of the novel. And so it was super hard to condense that and capture that while condensing it to be just the starting point for the story. Um, and then the beginning is just so important for setting the tone. And I really felt like I was condensing what could have been a novel into a chapter. The scene that you mention, um, where Augustine comes back and talks with Colette, that was one of the easiest scenes that I ever wrote. And I teach writing. I've taught it in a lot of different capacities. I most recently at the Loft Literary Center in uh, Minneapolis. And I get this question from my students and I tell them that often the scenes I like best and the scenes that are easiest to write are the last scenes that I write in revision. Mm -hmm. And I enjoy them all throughout. By the time you are revising, you have learned your book, you have discovered what it's about, and you have actually become the expert that you were trying to pretend you were the whole way through, but you were not. Because as you're writing a book, it is a stranger. Like it is, it is this thing that you are groping at and you're trying to understand. But after six years, which is how long it took me to write this book, I finally knew what it was saying and what it meant or what I wanted it to mean. And so I was able to go back and place in some of these scenes that, that said it, that like, there's the thing. And that scene is one in particular that it was one of the last scenes that I wrote. Mm -hmm. And it's one of my favorite scenes. It just came because I was so familiar with these characters and so familiar with what they needed to say to each other. That was really fun. And another scene like that is there's a scene where Colette is taking Leo to a museum Mm -hmm. and they discuss art and they discuss the work, the function of light and darkness in visual art. And that was another scene that was very kind of a thesis statement for the book. And it was easy to write by that time. I had been struggling for six years to figure out how to get that in, how to say, where to say that, how to say that. Mm -hmm. And then at that last minute, it was like, oh, this is where it goes. And and there it goes, you know? So that's, that's a really, I don't love revision. I've had a long, slow relationship (laughs) of warming up to revision. And so those experiences were really rewarding. And I've I've had mentors who have said, no, revision actually becomes fun at some point. And I was like, okay, I'll take your word for it. But so it was an experience where I was like, oh, yeah, maybe. I love that. I get, because it is that, you know, you get to those scenes and it's one of those things where I think, you know, as a reader, you're kind of, you're already feeling that. And then to have it be like, yes, it's like, like confirms everything. And it yeah. just makes you feel like a very whole and very yeah. like, okay, yes, yes. Like I'm, I am grasping everything that in like in the right way, you know, in the ways yeah. like I, it's kind of like, you know, confirming your feelings. And so it, it's funny that you were talking about uh, the tuberculosis outbreak, because that's, that's kind of leading into my next <laughs> question um, about how this novel, 
obviously, it, you know, it spans many years, but it's also, you know, many continents, different places. Uh, and, you know, you cover this, the New England vampire pandemic, which I will tell you, um, or panic, sorry, I did not, I was not aware of. And I will say that that set me down quite a Google rabbit hole yeah. um, after reading that just about, you know, talking about consumption and this tuberculosis outbreak. And I don't know, sometimes I think that you type in things and then it like can come back. At, you oh, know, yeah. so I felt like all it took for me was like one night after, after, you know, right, right after I started reading it, just be like, is this, did this happen? And then I felt like I was getting like articles, like all the time. So yeah. It was like consuming me, but you're crossing the Atlantic. You're, you're in France during World War II. You're this Eastern European folklore. Then you're, you, you she, she goes through Alexandria. And fast forward to modern times back in the States, I imagine the research for this story took you down many paths. Uh, was there anything in particular while that was all happening that sort of took you by surprise? Um, the vampire panic was had to be the biggest one. Nobody does know about it, which is just no. incredible <laughs> because everybody knows about the Salem witch trials. Yes. And nobody knows about the vampire panic, which happened a hundred years later. This is happening at the end of the 1800s, which is not very long ago. <laughs> no. And I think that, that, I mean, among many other shocking things with it, you were very historically accurate in the book in terms of describing the remedies and the things that they did. Because, you know, you always think like, oh, authors take liberties. And then when I start, I was like, oh no, that happened. <laughs> that exactly and, happened. And what I wrote it sounds like it has to be taking liberties. Yeah. It does not sound real. It sounds like fantasy. So just to give the listeners and viewers a sense of it, consumption was ravaging the countryside and people became convinced that it was vampires, um, that their loved dead ones were becoming vampires in the grave and coming back and slowly taking family members one by one. And that's sort of due to the nature of tuberculosis and how yes. it manifests and how it's just slow wasting disease. And it moves from one person to another, to another. They dug up graves and they looked at them and they were looking for evidence of vampirism. They were looking for rosy cheeks. They were looking for fresh blood in the hearts. And this was a time when there was so much uh, diversity as far as immigration and people coming from all different countries. And, and there were people from Eastern Europe or other places that had familiarity with vampire lore and became the experts on what to do in these situations. And Mercy Brown is the most famous of the accused vampires, a little girl, but they found so many grave sites where the bones had been crushed, where the skulls had been fractured, where they'd been rearranged so that they couldn't crawl in the night, you know, just weird, wild, wild stuff. No, it is. And that's why, you know, you, you, when you start doing that, you, know, you start going back and like, oh, what, what if this is true? What if it's not? And then you realize it's all true. I was, it, it kind of, yeah. How do more people not know about this? Yeah. Uh, I, for one, you know, thinking back to, you know, when I was in high school and, you know, doing a term paper on the Salem Witch Trials, I would have been very interested to include, yeah. <laughs> to still sort of include a side. We're, you know, talking about how, you know, we didn't really get over it a hundred years later than we were, we were back at our own, you know, tricks, like doing, you know, kind yeah. of in this yeah. hysteria. And then, yeah, to, to say that, that it wasn't that long ago, even when you write it and, you know, from Colette or I guess Anna at that time uh, perspective, I, I remember there was, and I'm trying to remember, the, you know, obviously the line, but it was, she was kind of like, well, this is, this is just how it was. Like, this is how, this is how people acted and this is what they did. And almost like a complete, not a complacency, but just, you know, kind of like normalizing, like this was normal behavior. And it's just so mind blowing. And I think to myself, well, I'm sure there are things that we're doing now that in a hundred years, people will just be like, that was horrific. How mm -hmm. could we have possibly done that? And our explanation would be, well, that was, that was what we, you know, that was what we were doing at the time. We didn't know any better. Yeah. So that brings me to talking about, you know, that, that sort of Eastern European folklore and, uh, you know, vampire folklore. So I will say that I am, uh, there's many subgenres of fiction that I love, but I am probably most drawn and I'm unapologetically so to sort of vampire stories. I love them. Uh, you could be trying to sell me on something that like I would never in a million years read, like, you know, giving me the plot. And then all you have to say is like, oh, and then there's vampires in it. And I'll be like, Okay, fine, I'll read it. Like, I, it, it could be something I would never read. I think there's just something so fascinating to me around vampire lore and how it's, you know, it's constantly changing and it's so easily adaptable to the times as well as, you know, the, 
cultural differences, depending on where you're from. What brought you to the mythology around your vampire? I did a lot of research on vampire lore in what I found, I would say personally that I'm I'm more steeped in lore and in like the history of vampires mm-hmm. than I am in the fiction. I discovered that really vampirism is a really it's a broad category. It's a very mm-hmm. general monster. Basically, the requirement is that you feed on the life of another. Mm-hmm. And in different places, they looked very different. They behaved very differently. Uh, in some places, they felt more like zombies, like they were sort of dumb. They didn't, they just had this like forward motion that couldn't be stopped. And in others, they were more cunning in the way that we see now. But in, you know, various like African diasporic folklores, vampires are old hags, they fly, vampires have a, have been conflated with owls. And so there were lore, there was lore about women whose heads would come off in the night and go flying to find victims and would sort of sit on the window and look in, which sounds a lot like an owl at your window, perhaps. (laughs) And there's a lot of lore around mothers dying in childbirth and becoming vampires. They were some of the most feared, dangerous vampires because, which is so fascinating because it's a recognition of that intensity of drive for life and emotion and that um, really powerful connection to life that is very tragically thwarted. Mm -hmm. And so there was a lot of fear with mothers who died in childbirth. So all of that is basically what it did was give me a real sense of freedom in that I felt like I can do whatever I want with, with this vampire. I don't, I don't need to feel at all bound by the sort of, sort of hardened tropes that we see now because what we see in popular fiction and popular media is really kind of boiled down and and particular and mm-hmm. it, there really isn't a ton of rhyme or reason for why our vampires are always unable to go out in sunlight and they're always super sexy and they're always <laughs> you know there's there's actually I mean there is a line of that but there's so many other traditions to draw from so for me this is a fantasy novel but I was going for also kind of hyper realism Mm -hmm. Um, and so this is like if vampires were actual biological creatures who lived on these this earth what might they be like so there's nothing to do with garlic there's nothing they have reflections in the mirror they go out in the day their biology has been transformed so that they do not have sexual reproduction organs because that's not how they reproduce. So it is is uh, perhaps the least fantastical iteration of vampires <laughs> that, that I don't know, that I'm aware of. You know, it's a creature that consumes. And what do they consume and how they feel and how, and their, you know, again, their drive, what are their drives? And I think sometimes taking away the sparkles and the garlic and the reflection, you know, all that stuff and kind of drilling it down is almost scarier because it's like, you know, living among us, you know, and yeah. that, in itself, you know, not being able to sort of, you know, easily identify a vampire. And if you think about a lot of even Dracula, and it, it was very apparent and, you know, you could, you could tell, and, and it was just um, obviously over the top. And, and while I enjoy that <laughs> to an extent, this is just the core of them, you know, that, that how they consume and, 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 and their life and in what they know and how they live. But uh, I think drilling it down makes it very scary. Yeah. <laughs> it makes it, it, makes yeah. it a little more terrifying. And also, I mean, I would hope more relatable because yeah. I think we all feel like secret monsters to some yes. extent. You know, we all have hidden things that we are careful not to allow others to see and that we are like, wish I could get rid of these things. <laughs> you know, it'd be really helpful. Um, but in that respect, you know, learning and then also learning to live with them, because I think that's a big thing with Colette is that she's so she wants to sort of separate herself. You know, she's not with her her kind in a way, as you know, as it's put, she wants nothing to do with that part. I mean, she kind of accepts it that that's it's there, but it's it's she's not embracing it or at least again. Not so many spoilers, but at least not until <laughs> yeah. until until later talking about again, I, you know, I keep on saying Colette, because that's how you were saying how her form. But it's like, well. You know, Anna, Anya, uh, and Colette, depending, I guess, on the time, uh, is the main yeah. protagonist in this story. You've created so many wonderful characters throughout. And it was so 
you know, what you said earlier about how you could have written like a whole book on just the, that New England vampire panic. Part of me feels like you could have written a whole book on any one of these characters. I mean, Augustine and Mercy and Vanu and uh, Eru, I hope I'm saying that right, uh, Peroska, Paul, Aeneas and Hala. I mean, while some of them do make, again, no spoilers, um, a sort of second entrance, if you will, there were so many characters that I felt like you must have, would, you know, did you have that, you know, where you wanted to maybe explore them more, but realize that they were there for, you know, a, pur- a purpose in a, you know, a world where anything goes, uh, who gets the spinoff series? Like, who would you, <laughs> who would you, which character? Because I honestly, I could, I would want, I would read every single one of them, like, the, oh you know, their gosh. backstories and, you know, what happens to them or it's just, uh, yeah. So I had to, I had to put in a silly one. That is so kind. And I, I love hearing that because my characters are my love, you know, like that's the thing I love. And I worried that there were too many of them. Mm-mm. I was prepared to hear, like, pick a story, you know, or whatever. But I just wanted all of it. And what a vehicle, this woman who has this long life and and has this really important sort of rhythm of receiving and then losing and having to cope with that. Um, And so it was important to make what she received, the relationships that she developed, feel deep and meaningful and rich. And if I don't know everything about their story, I still sense it. And I, I have a real sense of like the richness of their personal story. I have been asked on occasion if I think there will be a sequel. It's certainly possible. I did write a couple hundred pages of a sequel way back when I was in grad school. And, and there are ideas that certainly still intrigue me. Um, one of my favorite characters is the grandfather. Um, I really am drawn to him and his story his both his history and his future just like what are you up to he is a prominent character in what I have of a sequel which who it could be totally scrapped and you know whatever but I'm I'm really intrigued by him I also really love Ehru um I love them all but uh there's something about these characters who sort of embody what Colette needs to discover more of these characters who are saying okay we you can do your couple hundred years of being lost and aimless but but then at some point like toughen up and move forward let's do something with with this time that we have and they're very unapologetic and I am fascinated by that so I'm really intrigued by them Paul has a really special place in my heart I you know I think about his history and it's Mm -hmm really heartbreaking to me I don't know who all has a spinoff in them but <laughs> but I but I like the fact that I kind of feel like any of them any of could, them and I would enjoy I yeah. would enjoy that because I love them they're there for the moment they're there to sort of you know serve serve their purpose in in the in the larger story but yeah you could you can't help but think about when she would leave a character and you were kind of like oh my gosh like what is going to happen to that person or yeah. And what happened to them prior to them meeting that led to them here? And um, it was really interesting, especially, you know, with the with the grandfather and, you know, particularly in the in the conversation uh, that she has with Augustine later on and kind of helping to sort of, yeah, that he is he is living. He, he has accepted his who he is and that might not be a great person, but he's accepted that that's what he you know, that's who he is. And he's moving forward with it. And he is he's living his life and he's doing, you know, what he thinks is his purpose. And and then even with Eru, um, I love that. He's like an activist and, you know, and, and like, you're kind of like, yeah, of course that was, you know, and just kind of leaning into that, like you said, like that he is, he's accepted his fate and the time that he has, and he's going to do all that he can in this world and, and what he can do. And there's a lot of light and darkness throughout the novel. And I think, you know, even, but, you know, between these characters, obviously, you know, going into the folklore and the art, but then even just back and forth with all these sort of, I don't want to say ancillary characters, but, you know, these side, these sort of supporting mm-hmm. roles and and then, and Colette, it's just, it's just really beautiful throughout this, that sort of metaphor that kind of follows you throughout the novel. So in talking about art, uh, so art does play a, a large role sort of throughout and, and Colette's life. And obviously starting uh, at the beginning where she's, you know, carving, you know, with her father, carving uh, gravestones and then sort of 
moving on to discovering, you know, more her artistic talents and other mediums and then sort of fostering this love of art in others. So it really inspires her and sort of sustains her. So I have to ask if there's anything uh, in particular art or otherwise that sort of sustains you, inspires you. I love art in every form. Um, And I'm married to a fine art painter. My husband uh, has been a visual artist as long as we've been together. And I am so lucky that I have a house filled with paintings (laughs) for free by my favorite artist. I also love, uh, I love to think about the crossover between what different arts can do how they do them what's true in visual art and if that's also true in verbal arts or in dramatic arts Mm -hmm. um, I really geek out on that so I have been so fortunate to be really steeped in the process of visual art in the theory of visual art because of my husband and there's so much overlap and overlap in a way that feels kind of metaphysical even you know it's not it's not something as simple as like composition and like proportion which those have really fascinating corollaries as well but they're just strange things like the way light behaves and the way that you have to use light to draw attention to certain things and the way you have to use darkness to draw attention to certain things there's no real clear reason why that should be true in both the literary arts and in the visual arts, but it is. One of the art lessons that Colette gives um, is that in, in painting, in visual arts, the brightness, the strikingness of light or the, the lighter pigments in a painting is dependent on the darkness of the dark pigment pigments in the same painting and on their relationship to one another. So the brightest white you can achieve in a painting is going to be a white that is placed side by side with the darkest dark you can put in a painting. And that contrast is is beautiful. It's striking. It draws the eye, creates drama and beauty. You know, if you read the book, the same I'm I'm trying to do the same thing Mm -hmm. in it. Um, There is a lot of darkness, but the hope is that that contrast, that setting them up against each other actually makes you hungry for the light. And it certainly does in Colette's life. All that darkness has just made her so, so unbearably hungry for some goodness, for some light, for some beauty to break in. I live on art. I'm an art vampire. That's how I sustain myself. (laughs) See, we're all that. That's that's we're your that's kind. your inner monster. That's your <laughs> that's what you consume. No, and it, that's I think that's why vampire lore is appealing in in whatever way you want to, um, however you want to look at it. But um, I think you know, and, and again, you mentioned this in, in many different ways, and art being just one of them. But even in when you're actually talking about the gods, the um, Chernabog, and I think I'm saying this correctly, and please correct me if I'm not, and Balabog, and how it's, it's supposed to be light and dark, but are they really just one and the same, you know, and just giving different gifts when you, when you need them, um, depending on what you need, you know, if you are, if you are searching for that light, if you need maybe that darkness or, you know, to sort of amplify something else. And so I think it's just wonderful, the many different things that can inspire us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I love a great, uh, opening line. And I know you said you had many revisions with your first uh, chapter, but it was wonderful. And I love a killer closing one. And I think probably you know where I'm going with this. Uh, so the final sentence in God of Endings, and I it left me with chills. And I even just thinking about it now, I think I'll never, I don't think I'll ever forget it. Like, I think it's just oh, something that. that you, yeah, it stays with you. Um, so without Thank giving so too much, much away. <laughs> um, so, I mean, without giving too much away, what kind of brought you to this fantastic conclusion? Did you always know this is where it was going? I kind of did. The novel started out as a novella um, that I wrote in grad school just for fun, just because, like I mentioned, it sort of appeared to me and I I did it. And it was a really fast process that was just kind of a good time. And I didn't think a whole lot 
about it, but the novella focused on the on Colette's present story in the 1980s, mm-hmm. where she's running this art school for children. And the main conflict is this conflict with Leo and his family. Um, and she her being drawn into the dysfunction of this family and having to make some important choices about how she's going to choose to be in the world, and whether she's going to just sort of turn a blind eye and hide from things, or she's going to take ownership and responsibility and do something. The very earliest form of this book had that line as its ending. And I feel so lucky that the novel happened in this way because I'm working on another novel and I'm doing the traditional thing of starting at the beginning and when you get to the end, stop. You just have to delay gratification so long. (laughs) And with having written a novella, I got to have a mini sort of a condensed version of the book. I got to get feedback from my brilliant peers at the University of Kansas and from my mentors there. And I got really valuable feedback on a whole and then got to go back and expand. And um, I, I like to think of it as having been like an accordion folder where, you know, I've got this, this spine and then they get to sort of drop in more dreams and more of the past. So the past story is really what, what developed to make it novel length. And that was so fun to get to like, you know, just kind of run those rabbit trails. So the beginning was not the same, but the last line was the same. And, and fortunately that was always what it was moving towards. Um, So that never wavered. And I got to just make that end point, hopefully more power impactful and, and meaningful by getting to add so much um, to it. It was also fun. Like the, the first chapter was the hardest, but it was a really fun puzzle. And, and I knew at that point, I was pretty happy with the rest. And I knew like that, that first chapter, it just, it has to impress. Like that's what you, what, that's what everyone should be aiming at in the writing of their first chapter. There's no room to take your time. So it was fun to think literally, like, what's the best first line I can put on this, you know, and I don't know that I, I don't know that that's it, but, but I hope it's a good one. (laughs) No, I, I, this, it's a good bookend. Like it's a good, it's a good, and I will say that leading, leading up, I think, you know, again, it's always great to have that opening, you know, killer opening line and closing line, but obviously what's in the middle has a lot to do with making it so great. And I will say, um, the tension leading up to the final conclusion that I think definitely made that last line what it was. I don't think, I mean, if it had been in any other context, it, I don't necessarily know it would have been as having that feeling. Um, but how it's, how it leads up to it, I will tell you, I, I really thought you were going to do us dirty. I really thought I was, when I was reading, I was like, something's going to happen. Like something's like, you want it to, you want that conclusion. Okay. And I really was like, we're not going to get it. We're not going to get it. This is not going to happen. And then you felt like her. Yes, I did. Yeah. I was like, because I think you just, you know, in life, you're like, something's, you know, the other shoe is going to drop. Yeah. Kind of that feeling. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you feel it for her and you just, you just don't want it to happen. And then I don't know, maybe other people might look at the ending and feel a little odd for it, but I was, I was all in it. I'm happy to hear that. Yeah. People have been. <laughs> quite divided on the ending yes which is really which I'm I'm cool with like <laughs> I, you know I I love to to argue endings with people so you know have at it but I think it all goes back to you know what I was saying earlier about how I think you know when I talk to people and I you know who have read this book everyone comes away with something different and I think it is I think it is but I think that's natural for any book you know when you're coming to it who are you and what point in your life are you in you know what what what's going on around you I think there's a lot of environmental factors that um, make us love or despise or you know a book or you know not agree with something or or you know just kind of love it. And sometimes I think, you know, it's, it's, I'd never want to go back sometimes. And certain, certain books I do go back and read. And then there's other books where I'm like, nope, I was, this was the place and time that I needed to read this book. And I don't necessarily know if it will, it will change, you know, when you're reading it again. But yeah, I think that that's, what's so wonderful about this novel. And it's just, you know, there's so many different ways that you can take it depending on the person you are. Um, and so many ways that you can argue 
Colette's fate, you know, what she's doing with her life. Um, I think it's just really interesting. And I think it's very telling, you know, when people start talking about it, about who they are and what yeah, they're and yeah. kind of what they're going through. And I, I feel like the question of the book is a really live debate. Like it's yeah. not a foregone conclusion. And so there is going to be strong feelings to, and, and she argues both sides yes. pretty passionately. Yeah. And so some people would be like, no, you convinced me from the first and I'm still there. <laughs> and other people will be like, oh gosh, yeah, I, I see it differently now. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, definitely. Good. It's definitely a roller coaster. So because I'm always looking for uh, book recommendations from brilliant women, uh, mm-hmm. who are or what are you reading uh, now? Um, or what was the last book you read that you just couldn't stop talking about? Yeah, so I'll give two recommendations. Uh, one is just for brilliant women. And actually, I have not even read it yet. The day of my book launch, I was so excited to buy Kelly Link's new book of short stories. <laughs> Speaking of brilliant, yes, brilliant women, um, I am obsessed with Kelly Link. I highly recommend everyone read Kelly Link's new book. I will be reading it. I'm so excited. She is a brilliant woman. And then for a book I actually have read, The Shining. For some reason, I, I had never read it and I, I had seen the movie and was kind of so-so on it, but um, I read it and it, the book is so different. From, I mean, in, in so many ways, it's the same, but in really fundamental character ways, it's radically different. They're not even about the same thing. And I noticed that I really felt like The Shining is a very similar story to mine because it's about a parent terrified by his own monstrosity, his own destructive power, who is forced into close proximity with someone he loves who is incredibly vulnerable and he is trying to fight his own monstrousness and struggling to contain his own destructive power in relation to his little son. And so I was just like, oh my gosh, I had no idea that we had that Stephen King and I had so much in common. That the sitting um, gem was here this whole time. No, yeah, because because I had never really heard it discussed in those terms. Everybody loves it. Everybody, you know, it's so many people's favorite Stephen King novel. But I had never really heard that angle of it, and I just felt like, oh, I think that I get you as a writer a little more than I realized that I do. And it's just so well done. It's just really well done. And this, folks, is why you should always read the book. And not just watch the movie. Exactly. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. And uh, yeah, I very, very different experience. Yeah, it's always, yeah, it's, I mean, you can, the, I have books where, and I know this is like completely going to be completely random, um, but I always use it as an example, like Bridget Jones Diary. Mm-hmm. I love the movie and I love the book. They are very but different. They're not the same. They're yeah. not the yeah. same. I love uh-huh. them equally. But yes. they are different. And I love that's them for the different best reasons. possible scenario when you yes. get two for one. It's not as good when you're like one over the other. But yes, or when it, it kind oh, of, you know, it takes it takes they take the story again, liberties as they yes. as they do. Um, but that's so wonderful. That's so wonderful. I couldn't I couldn't think of a better way to, to wrap this up. Yeah. Read the book, everyone. Jacqueline. Yes. Always, <laughs> always read the book. Mm-hmm. Um, Jacqueline, thank you again. Thank you for this propulsive gut punch of a novel. That's probably the best way I can describe it. Um, This has been wonderful. The God of Endings is out now. Thank you so much for having me. This has been awesome. Hello, readers. We're back with another TBR Top Off. We're going to recommend a couple of great books to pick up when you stop in for your copy of God of Endings. I'm Mark coming to you from my Barnes & Noble store in Cincinnati, and I'm joined by my book buddy, Madison. Hello, Madison. Hello, I'm Madison, and I'm joining you from my store in Los Angeles. So we've got a couple of great books to talk about. I'm going to go ahead and jump right in with a book that has been rising in popularity, and that is Carmilla by Joseph Sheridan Lafanu. This is a book that I, I guess I would call it an uncovered classic. It was originally published in the 1870s as sort of like a serial, kind of like a penny dreadful serial release. Now it's collected in its novella form, and it is blowing up all over the socials, and for good reason. This is a sapphic vampire tale. Essentially, we're following a woman named Laura. She is living in a mansion, fairly isolated, pretty lonely, 
mostly, I think, bored. And a chance encounter with a woman named Carmilla just changes her life forever. Uh, she is immediately taken by this woman who is confident. She's mysterious. She's alluring. She is gorgeous and is nothing like anything Laura has experienced before. And this friendship that forms very quickly develops into something more. And Laura starts to realize that her feelings are coming at a very gruesome cost. So this is a book that predates Dracula by a couple of decades. Um, it, I think, was sort of lost into obscurity for quite a long time. Uh, so I'm really glad that it's getting the recognition that it, it is. It's creepy, it's sexy, and I think a, an interesting take on the vampire tale that I think readers really haven't experienced before. So please, please check out Carmilla. Madison, what do you have for us? Well, I do love a good Penny Dreadful. I love Penny Dreadfuls. But I went a slightly different spin. And I feel like it is a book that often gets judged by its cover. And I don't think it should be. And that is The Lovely War by Julie Berry. Um, so I would recommend this book for people like the cover looks like your standard historical fiction cover. And I feel like that's why some people might pass it by. But it's really for fans of if you're a fan of historical fiction and if you're a fan of Greek mythology. And I think it is a definitely new take on seeing like Greek gods and goddesses. Like I haven't really seen it written in this format before. There are two main love stories in The Lovely War. The first one takes place in 1917 in World War I when Hazel and James first see each other. It's that whole magical love at first sight. Uh, she's a pianist. He wants to be an architect. But then war happens in the midst of love. So their love is cut short because James is sent to war. And then you have our second couple, which is Aubrey... Edwards. He is also sent to the tr trenches. He wants to be a musician. He really never planned to fall in love. And then he does with Colette. He meets Colette. And so you have these two very beautiful love stories. And where the Greek mythology comes in is these stories are told 30 years after the fact, where you meet the Greek gods and goddesses, because Aphrodite is telling their tale. So you also get to see them like the Greeks in like a Manhattan apartment 30 years later. She's telling the tale and you really get to see how love and war go hand in hand. And that story is how does war always win or does love always prevail? Um, I'm going to make you read it to find out. But I just love how the two mediums of historical fiction and Greek mythology were just intertwined. And I love that our narrator is Aphrodite. I think it just adds an extra element to the story. So, which is why I wanted to recommend The Lovely War by Julie Berry. Fantastic choice. And I think you're right. That's a book that I think gets overlooked a lot with the popularity of mythology retellings and Greek myths in general. This is one that I think can kind of rise up in the ranks as something to really take notice of. So nice pick as usual. But that is all we have for today. Thanks so much for tuning in to Poured Over. Please make sure to give us a rating and subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can also follow us on our socials at Barnes & Noble. I'm Mark. You can follow my home store at BN Westchester. And I'm Madison. You can follow my home store at BN Events Grove. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Happy reading. Bye. Thank you for listening. Poured Over is a Barnes & Noble production. To help other readers find us, please rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts.